Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker Oats, the giant of the cereals, presents Sergeant Preston of the Yukon. (coughs) It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King! On, you husky! (coughs) Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Brought to you by Quaker Oats. Sergeant Preston was on the trail when he saw Tom Gordon near the latter's newly found mining property. Gordon's sled was loaded, and the elderly prospector was harnessing his dogs when Preston stopped his team near the mine. Okay. Hi, Oscar. Hello. Hello, Tom. Hi, Sergeant. Don't tell me you're giving up on this mine of yours. Giving up? No, sir. Not when it's given up to me. Giving up more gold than I ever saw anywhere in these parts. You really made a strike, Tom? Yeah, look at those bags on that sled. There's nothing but gold in them. That's right. Filled with dust they are. Dust and some nuggets I washed out for taking off. Well, congratulations, Tom. You've worked hard. You deserve to strike it, Rich. Thanks. I'm taking this load to Whitehorse for banking. I aim to hold on to what I've mined so far. I'll help you, Tom. I'm going to Whitehorse myself. Huh? You, you'll help me? Well, doggone. I never expected anything like this. This is swell. We should make White Horse within three days. Unless a blizzard comes up, I don't like the looks of that sky. I don't either, Sergeant. Uh, Where will we stop on the way south? Bent Hat will be one place, I know. We can't make Bent Hat for at least two days. We'd better stay over at North End tonight. North End, huh? (laughs) Well, that's a good idea. They have what they call a hotel there. Oh? (laughs) It'll be safe sleeping in a place like that. You ready to start, Sergeant? I am. So am I. Up front, King. All right, on King! On, you husky! The wind was howling, and there were snow flurries in the air that night as Sergeant Preston and Tom Gordon brought their sleds to a stop in front of the Ramshackle Hotel in North End. Okay. On, you husky! Let's get that stuff unloaded, Tom. Right, Sergeant. They began at once to unload the sacks of gold dust and small nuggets from the sled. And then, before doing anything else, they carried them inside and to the room assigned to them by the sleepy-eyed clerk. Say, hey, this room will be all right, Sergeant. Two beds in it, too. This will be the first time I've slept on a bed in more than three years. We'll put the bags in this closet, Tom. Sure thing. When they'd placed the gold in the closet, Sergeant Preston turned to Tom Gordon. You want to eat now, Tom? Well, not yet, Sergeant. (laughs) I'm not used to being on the trail so long. Not lately, that is. Uh, If if you don't mind, uh, I'm going to lie down for a while. Whatever you say, Tom. I'll take the dogs and sleds to Fred Summit's kennels there, down at the end of the street. You rest. I'll be back in an hour or so. Two men, Jack Finley and Buffalo Davis had been in the cafe opposite the hotel when Sergeant Preston and the prospector arrived and unpacked what could only be bags of gold dust. Now, as Preston led first his own team and then the dogs of Tom Gordon to the kennels at the end of the street, both men's thoughts took the same turn. Hey, Jack, that was gold they had in those bags they took into the hotel. Yeah, and that gold's inside now with only that old coot Tom Gordon to look after. (laughs) You're thinking what I am, huh? We can go in there and take it from them before anyone knows what's happened. No, no, no. Not just like that, Buffalo. Getting the gold would be easy. Holding on to it's another thing. The Preston round. Buffalo, we'll have to take care of that money. You're going to kill him, Jack? No. Other ways of taking care of him without having to kill him. Like what? Get our sled ready. Bring some rope from it. Well, I'll get the ropes, Jack, but what's the play? There's that broken-down cabin at the end of the street, just a little away from the kennels. Yeah. Preston will have to pass there, come back to the hotel. 
And here's what we'll do. Huh? I'll go to the rear of the cabin and start yelling. When he was sure that the dogs were fed and would be protected for the night, Sergeant Preston left Fred Summers' kennel. He and the king were passing a space between two empty shacks when they heard a yell from the darkness, seemingly to the rear of the building. Come on, King. Someone's in trouble. <laughs> Sergeant Preston, followed by King, rushed between the buildings toward the spot where Jack Finley was shouting for help. As they passed an open door in the deserted shack, King stopped suddenly and growled in warning. <laughs> but too late. Before Preston could heed the dog, Buffalo Davis leaped from the doorway and brought his gun down on the head of the Mountie. <laughs> As Preston fell to the snow-covered ground, King leaped at Buffalo, who retreated into the cabin. Take it down, down. Jack, help me, Jack. Jack! King's teeth closed around the arm of Buffalo Davis, shaking the crook's gun to the floor. Davis, panic-stricken, called for help and tried to break away from the animal. And then Jack Finley ran into the cabin and used his great strength in an attempt to loosen the dog's hold. Finley, behind King, wrapped his arms around the dog's neck and pulled mightily. Buffalo! Buffalo, when I get him off of you, run outside! There! Now run! The pressure on the dog's throat caused him to open his mouth wide. Davis, visibly shaken, ran outside. Finley, his arms still around the struggling dog, inched toward the doorway. He used his strength in a final effort and pushed King away from him toward the far wall. He pivoted and rushed into the night, slamming the door behind him and leaving King inside the windowless room. Uh, thanks, Jack. That dog was going to tear me to pieces. Never mind that. Help me tie and gag Preston. Then we'll carry him back to the cabin and... Throw him in the bushes. We'll continue our adventure in just a moment. Here's a time-saving breakfast tip for every mother who has a baby three months or older. When you cook good, nourishing, hot Quaker oats for the baby, it's all ready for the rest of the family, too. The creamy, delicious, smooth Quaker oats they love. The easy directions are on every package of Quaker oats or mother's oats, which are the same. And you know, doctors can tell you that among cereals, oatmeal is the finest source of bodybuilding protein for your family. That's why so many pediatricians recommend good, nourishing Quaker oats for babies from the time they're three months old. And recently, a leading state university proved that the protein in Quaker oats is better for growth than that of 14 nationally known breakfast cereals, including two well-known baby cereals. So for the wonderful benefits it can give your whole family, from baby to hard-working grown-ups, serve good hot Quaker or mother's oats every morning. It costs less than a penny a serving. Now to continue. Minutes after they left Sergeant Preston bound and gagged in the brush, the crooks entered the hotel and knocked the dozing night clerk unconscious. <coughs> then they went directly to the room where Tom Gordon lay resting on the bed. Before the prospector could rise, the intruders were upon him. One swift blow, a gag in his mouth, and Gordon was no longer a problem for Findlay and Davis. They went to the closet and removed the sacks of gold. A few minutes later, the robbers placed the bags of dust and nuggets on their sled and started south. Hush! Hush, you hush! 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 Kennel owner Fred Summit left his kennels about midnight, carrying a lighted lantern, and started toward the cafe up the street. Hmm. A short distance from his place, he stopped as he heard the insistent barking of a dog somewhere nearby. He was in front of a deserted shack. The barking seemed to come from there. That's strange. He walked between two buildings to the side door where he could hear the dog. He pushed open the door, holding the lantern above his head. He immediately recognized the great husky that rushed toward him. King! What's the matter, King? What are you doing here? Where's Sergeant Preston? The dog tugged at Summit's sleeve with almost human insistence, and then rushed into the night. Summit followed. Outside, he found King sniffing at the ground. Then the dog raised its head and with a bound ran to the rear of the area. Something's happened here, all right. Judging by the snow, there must have been... What is it, King? King had returned and once more was tugging at the man's sleeve. 
The dog lover, knowing of King's great intelligence, followed the dog immediately. His lantern held high again, somewhat walked through the brush where King led him. And there he found Sergeant Preston bound and gagged. What? Sergeant Preston? Just a moment, Sergeant. I'll have you free in a jiffy. Some had helped revive the Mountie, and together they went back to the hotel. Disregarding the clerk who greeted him in a frantic manner, Sergeant Preston led the way to the room where he had left Tom Gordon. Tom, Tom Gordon. Oh, I was afraid of this. He's tied up and gagged, too. Sergeant, who did this to you and him? What's it all about? Someone's stolen the gold Gordon had in the closet. It's empty. I'll take the gag from Tom's mouth and untie him. When Sergeant Preston removed the gag and the ropes, Tom Gordon still did not move. Sergeant Preston felt the man's heart and pulse, and then forced open his eyelids. Oh, he's in bad shape. Summit, is Dr. Gray still in town? Yes, Sergeant. You want me to get him? Would you please? Meanwhile, I'll do what I can to help Tom. When the doctor returned with Summit and began to treat the old prospector, Sergeant Preston left at once. He questioned the hotel clerk and men in the cafe and got a description of the crooks and the clothing they wore. Then, finally, he found the fresh trail of their dogs and sled on the road from town heading south. Well, King, whoever they are, they're heading toward Bent Hat, and we're going after them. Late the next afternoon, Jack Finley and Buffalo Davis, numb and almost blinded by snow, staggered with their team into the town of Bent Hat. Before heading for a hotel or any of the cafes dotting the street, Finley spoke to Davis. Yeah, this is bad for us, Buffalo. We never figured on this blizzard. No, it's getting worse. We'll not be able to leave here, Jack. Not while it's like this. I know it. We're lucky we got this far. Buffalo, we have to worry about that Mountie Preston. Yeah, sure we do. He's liable to be on our trail by now. Unless he died from cold. We should have killed him at Gordon, I guess. Yeah, but we didn't. So we can't take chances. In case he is alive. What do you mean, can't take chances? We'll have to. Don't argue about words. Let's get to the hotel. Shave these whiskers and cut our hair short. Uh, so Preston can't identify us if he sees us, huh? What about these clothes we're wearing? Well, we'd buy new ones. Then we'll move around town, saying we just came north from Whitehorse. Well, don't you think someone might get wise? Ah, uh -huh. not if we're careful and play our part straight. We'll fool them, Buffalo. But we better start fooling them right away. Come on. A few hours later, as Sergeant Preston was nearing Bent Hat, two other men worked glumly in a shack at the end of Bent Hat's main street. They were medicine showman Montague Rogers, spare and tall, and his dumpy assistant, Nifty. Yeah, that's sufficient, Nifty. Yeah, all right, boss. They had just emptied the contents of a large barrel into a great number of brightly labeled bottles. The labels proclaimed the liquid as Rogers' Golden Elixir, a cure for all diseases known to man. Rogers corked the last bottle and placed it beside the rest yeah. on the end of the large platform at the front of the building. Nifty, my boon companion, we've bottled enough of our foul medication to last us until it's time to take our show on the road next spring. Yes. By the looks of that blizzard outside, we'll not sell a bottle till we do take to the road. Nobody will ever come to see our show tonight. Because of a little blizzard? Nifty, you forget, we are premier entertainers, actors who will make these gold-mad scavengers forget the wind and snow while we beguile them with our songs, stories, and uh, rheumatic dancing. They all have aches and pains. They all need Roger's golden elixir. Yeah, and they'll all stay away from this joint tonight. You'll see. Ah, you're a pessimist, Nifty. I'm a starving pessimist, Money. Somebody better come tonight or we'll end up eating each other. Ah, you have an idea there, Nifty. And I have the teeth. Uh, however, enough of your cannibalistic thoughts. Let's take this empty barrel and place it at the rear of this temple of medicine and amusement, huh? Put it outside? What for? The only barrel we have for mixing this leap up we make. Ah, nevertheless, we'll place it outside until after the lame and halt leave tonight. We don't want them to realize our panacea is made here in a barrel. After all, I tell them we bring it to them from the herb-ridden jungles of Africa. Well, it'll get full of snow if we put it out there. Grand. When we take the barrel back inside, we'll melt the snow and use it for our next mixture. Yeah, all right. If we have to put the barrel outside, let's get it over with. You ready? Yeah. I'm too weak to handle it alone. 
Uh, give me some help. Of course, yeah. of course. Meanwhile, Jack Finley and Buffalo Davis had bought new clothes at Herman White's clothing store. Finley had bribed the clerk in the hotel at which they were staying to say that both men had been clean-shaven when they arrived, and that they had come from Whitehorse. Then, self-assured, they set out for the Sluice Box Cafe. An hour later, Sergeant Preston arrived in Bent Hat, found a place to leave his dogs and sled, and then started a round of the hotels and cafes. As Preston entered the sluice box cafe, King's hair bristled, and he began to sniff the air and growl. What's the matter, King? Take it easy, fella. As easy. Preston bent to pat the dog, two clean-shaven men, well-dressed but suddenly panicky, slipped from the far end of the bar and hurried out the rear door of the cafe. King began to calm down, but continued to sniff the air as Sergeant Preston walked to the bar and spoke to the bartender. Hello, Rand. Hello, Sergeant. I'm looking for a couple of gold thieves. The Mounty told of his quest for two bewhiskered men and the reason for wanting them. Red Oakley, the bartender, was unable to assist him. Nobody's come in here from the north as far as I know. Not in the last couple of days, anyway. Only two men I know about came in from the south, from Whitehorse, sometime this afternoon. But they didn't have whiskers. As a matter of fact, they're down at the other end of the bar. Where? Right, right. Hey, that's funny. They're gone. They were there a minute ago. At that moment, another man entered from the rear through the door where Davis and Findlay had made their exit. He was Herman White, the clothing store owner. And he walked up to greet Sergeant Preston. Sergeant Preston! Well, well, I'm glad to see you, Sergeant. What brings you to Bent Hat so soon after your last visit? I'm looking for a couple of thieves, Herman. Uh, you uh -huh. haven't seen two fellows, both with whiskers, dressed in parkas, and new in town, have you? By golly, thieves were they. I should have suspected that. Anyone shaving in this weather like they did. Shaving? You saw the men? Just a few minutes ago, they came out the rear door of this place, and just as I was coming along the street. It was snowing hard, but I can tell my own clothes. Those were the two I told you about, Sergeant. They must have been. But they said they were from Whitehorse. Yeah, they told me the same thing. But they had whiskers and hair down to here when they exchanged their parkas for the clothes they're wearing. Well, King, that's why you growled when we came in here. He must have got their scent, eh? Yes, and I didn't give him his chance to follow up on it. But we'll go after them now, King. Why, jolly thieves, sir. Sergeant, they seem to be heading for the hotel down the street. Lolly's place. Well, they'll not get far no matter where they head. We'll try Lolly's first. Come on, King. <laughs> Finley and Buffalo Davis had become startled when Sergeant Preston and King entered the sluice box cafe. They instinctively feared the dog's manner and had run into the night to be seen by Herman White, who had sold them their clothes. Realizing the man would be questioned and would tell the Mountie about them, they hurried to their hotel, grabbed the bags of gold, and left by a side door. Buffalo, blizzard or no blizzard, we'll have to get our sled and dogs and take off on the trail. Uh, why didn't we kill him when we had the chance? Why didn't we? Buffalo, hold back. Don't move for a minute. Finley, who had been walking slightly ahead, pulled back as he started to cross the rear of the alley between the hotel and the shack adjoining. He had seen Sergeant Preston and King crossing the street and heading for the lighted front door of the hotel. It's the Mountie Buffalo. He's going into the hotel. Hey, he'll be after us before we get the dogs together. Yeah. All right, Buffalo. Can't see us now. Let's run for it. Yeah. Where are you going, Jack? I don't know. Somewhere where we can hide these sacks. Somewhere with... Hey, Buffalo, here. Hey, where? Right here. Hey, what are you doing? Jack Finley had stopped at a barrel placed at the rear door of the cabin where Montague Rogers and Nifty Rucker waited for an audience that would never appear. Finley took both of the gold-laden sacks he carried and crammed them into the half-filled barrel. Yeah. Yeah. Mine are in there. Now, put yours in, Buffalo. Hey, Jack, this is crazy putting the gold in there. It's a trash barrel. Nobody look in there. Put those bags in, quick. Uh, all right. I still think it's crazy. When Davis had placed his bags into the barrel, he and Finley scooped up snow from the ground and packed it around and on top of the bags. As they hurried off, the top of the barrel seemed untouched. Yeah. Well, there's only one thing to do, Buffalo. If he catches up with us, we'll deny we were ever in North End. We stick to our white horse story. Yeah, but if the hotel clerk talks, if that fellow who sold us each clothes yeah, talks... No one can prove we stole Gordon's gold. Not if they can't find it, and they'll not. Now let's get out of here. The two crooks were making their way slowly to the spot where they'd placed their sled and dogs. And then suddenly a form loomed out of the darkness. All right, you two. I've been looking for you. Sergeant Preston. Hey, where, where'd you come from? Hey, what? Hey, the dog, keep away. Don't let him touch me. King leaped for Davis' arm and grabbed it in his teeth before the crook could reach for his gun. 
Finley, deciding to brazen out the situation, pretended a calmness he didn't feel. Sergeant, what's the idea? Call that dog off. What do you want with us? Don't gang. Let him go, boy. I'll take his gun. There. Yeah, he, he was going to bite. He, he, he was, was gonna... not going to bite. I think he recognizes you men, and I think I'll be able to prove why. Uh, we didn't do anything. We just came in from Whitehorse. You and then... did? You men step ahead of me and walk out into the street. I'm going to take you where we can talk. Get going. This is the end, Nifty. We die for want of food. A horrible end for the likes of me. Yes, I should say me. But at least we'll be able to drink. Oh, not the medicine. Not that Enough! No foul words about Roger's golden elixir. I speak not of that. I mean we drink water, pure and clear, from the snow we'll melt when we get the barrel inside. Come, help me roll it in. A few minutes later, they moved the snow-filled barrel from the rear of the shack into the single room. There. Uh, certainly must be a heavy snow. Yeah. This barrel seems to weigh a ton. But perhaps it's my weak condition. Perhaps... Nifty, what are you doing diving into the barrel like that? There's something in here, Monty. It... Hey, it's a stack. Hey, look, money in a barrel. This looks like... Let me tear open that top and see what's in there. Oh. Oh, no, no, it's a mirage. No, I'm going mad, Nifty. It's, it's gold. Look huh? at it. Gold. Cool. Nuggets and dust. Gold. It's good. <laughs> hey. Hey, Monty. He's fainted. Hey, Monty, wake up. Monty. We'll continue our adventure in just a moment. And now, here he is, that famous teller of tall tales, your old friend, Gabby Hayes. Hey, fellas and girls, I'll never forget the time years ago when me and my huskies was almost buried alive up in Yukon Blizzard. We'd been sledding through the storm all day. That night, I turned the sled up on its side so the huskies and me could get some shelter. By morning, we must have had a mountain of snow on top of us. It looked like we was buried alive. Well, sir, in a spot like that, what I needed was some good, nourishing, hot, quick root from my supplies. So I had a big bowl quick. And then I felt new strength charging through me. I felt my muscles begin to feel super powerful. You see, there's more strength and more energy in oatmeal than in any other whole grain cereal. Because Quaker Oats is the giant of the cereal. Yes, sir Bob. So I just put my shoulders under the sled, and I give such a heave. That mountain of snow cracked wide open with such force that seismography machines down in the States recorded an earthquake. Yes, sir. Say, you fellas and girls ought to see how the giant of the cereals can help you, too, like it does old Gabby. Every morning, eat a heaping bowl of creamy, delicious Quaker oats. Or make it mother's oats. Because shucks, they're exactly the same. Now to continue. Sergeant Preston's questioning and Herman White's testimony had been of no avail. The crooks, Finley and Davis, remained surprisingly cool and swore they had never been in North End. There was no sign of the gold on them in their sled or at the hotel. Finally, Sergeant Preston let them go. I've no legal right to hold you. At least not yet. Oh, you never will have. No? Well, let's see. You may leave Bent Hat, both of you, but if you do, I'll be right behind you. I'll stick with you until I find the gold I'm sure you stole. Oh, you're wasting your time, Sergeant. Let's go, Buffalo. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're uh, not running away, Sergeant. If you want us, we'll be over in the Sluice Box Cafe. Smiling to themselves, Finley and Davis entered the Sluice Box as they said they would. But they stopped short as they saw Red Oakley, the bartender, holding tightly to the coat of a tall, lean man who held a sack in his hand. Hey, look, Buffalo. Huh? And at the same moment, Hermit White, the clothing store owner, was running toward them. What's the matter, White? I, I'm, I, I'm sorry. It wasn't you who stole the gold, it was Monty Ratchet. 
He just came in with a bag full. I must get Sergeant Preston. Found the money in a barrel, he said. Hey, Jack, you hear that? I thought at the bar. You found money in a barrel. Our money. It has to be. Hey, let's find out. They can't take it from us. They can't. Let's run back to where we hid the bags. Sergeant Preston and King hurried to answer the summons to the cafe. There, Montague Rogers, shaking in anguish, explained for the third time what had happened. And I swear on Hamlet's grave that, that we found it in a barrel. Come back with me if you don't believe it. Ask my man Nifty. He has three more bags of gold there. I, I was hungry and thought I could use the gold. All right, Rogers, I believe you. We're going back to your place. Come on. When Sergeant Preston and Monty Rogers, followed by most of the men from the cafe, got to Rogers' cabin, they found Nifty Rucker on the floor unconscious. But the gold was gone. The rear door was open, and King rushed through the opening. King's picked up their scent. They heard him, and he knows them. Sergeant Preston led the way through the rear door, taking after King, who was loping ahead. Jack Findlay and Buffalo Davis had left the hut only a few moments before the appearance of Sergeant Preston and the men. They were running in the hope of getting their dogs and sled when they heard King behind them. Now, as they turned into an alley, they realized King was on their heels. They dropped the sacks of gold and turned to face the dogs. Hey, Jack, kill the dogs. No! Oh, 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 Buffalo! My arm! He's got it in his teeth! Take him off! Uh, swing him around, I'll kill him. All right, Davis, drop that gun. Uh, no, yeah, yeah, don't shoot there! Uh, I dropped it. Pick it up, will you, Mr. White? Oh. Yes, I, I have it, Sergeant. And the sacks of gold are here on the ground, too. Thanks. These are the cooks, all right, oh. no doubt about it. Oh, call this dog off! Aren't you going to help me? I'll call him off when you confess to stealing Gordon's gold. Oh, yeah, sure, sure, we'll confess. We took it. You have it there, haven't you? But call off this dog before Duncan, you... Duncan, oh. let him go, boy. Oh. Oh. I'll put the handcuffs on you and Davis and take oh. you to Whitehorse. Ah, oh, cat zooks, this oh. is as nerve-tingling as... as food. Rogers, when I have these men locked up, I'll treat you and your partner, Nifty, to the best meal in town. Bread is better than gold, Sergeant. Bread I can swallow. Gold... I cannot even chew. Well, you don't have to eat your heart out, as Finley and Davis are doing now. And now that we have them in the gold, this case is closed. Sergeant Preston will return in just a moment with a word about our next exciting adventure. Hello, folks. This is your friend, Aunt Jemima. Do your children like extra light pancakes? Then for supper tonight, just add milk to my Aunt Jemima pancake or buckwheat mix and bake the lightest pancakes ever. And the only pancakes with that good old South flavor. Fluffy, golden, feather light Aunt Jemima pancakes. Good for breakfast, lunch, or <laughs> supper tonight. Mm-hmm. And now, here is Sergeant Preston. Sergeant Preston reporting for duty, Inspector. Sergeant, a young man is in Whitehorse gunning for someone he claims framed him into jail a couple of years ago. Who is he, Inspector? A fellow named Neil Halton. I don't know who he's after, but I want you to get him and prevent a possible murder. Yes, sir. I'll go to Whitehorse at once. Neil Halton has almost reached the end of his long search. Can Sergeant Preston reach him and prevent murder? Be sure to hear this next exciting adventure. These radio dramas, a feature of Sergeant Preston of the Yukon Incorporated, are created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Enterprises, directed by Fred Flowerday, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. Sergeant Preston of the Yukon is brought to you every Sunday at the same time by Quaker Oats, the giant of the cereals. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Oat, the giant of the cereals. So long. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. <laughs>